where we've got this complexity of what we know about what animals are capable of doing. This will hopefully, hopefully add to that. Um, for really, for the last probably 10 years, I've been looking at um, the influence of stress on breed, uh, the, the uh, offspring of, of um, breeding uh, individuals, breeding uh, females. And, um, and for the, what I wanted to do today is actually present some really uh, recent information that really, to some extent, hasn't been published yet on that, which really looks at the importance of how stress impacts breeding individuals on a reef and how potentially marine protected areas might actually help give us some sort of resilience to um, the stresses that we might face in the future. Okay, let's have a look at some of the perceptions, overall perceptions we have of marine, marine protected areas. Firstly, um, it's those areas that are free from anthropogenic disturbance. Um, and when they're free from anthropogenic disturbance, we hope that the benthic and fish communities might in some way be healthier and might in some way be less stressed. And we're not really quite sure what we mean by less stressed, but we hope that that's the case anyway. We hope that these marine protected areas will protect the system from undue environmental stress, whether that be pollution or unnatural sedimentation or harvest. And it, Jeff pointed out a, a very good example that we've got there of where sometimes this doesn't happen and sometimes management might be at slightly the wrong scale to uh, allow us to do that. The Kimby Island example, I think, was a good example where um, st stress, anthropogenically produced stress, sediment sedimentation stress, wasn't actually managed and that we didn't allow uh, and potentially the uh, system within a marine protected area is to maybe exhibit the resilience that a marine population could potentially exhibit if we actually backed off from that stress. Okay, the stress was of course coral bleaching and, and really systematic coral bleaching over a number of years and then they had sedimentation on top of that as well, okay, on such a broad scale that it really did influence both some, the protected areas and the open areas as well. So our hope is that if we actually remove those anthropogenic stresses, then maybe the system might actually present, okay, there's the beer, okay, some aspect of uh, resilience. Okay, it might actually bounce back for, from future disturbances. Some more expectations of marine protected areas. Firstly, for at least for harvested species anyway, we expect them to have both more uh, fishes, but also we expect those fishes to be larger just because they've grown more and the size selective mortality of fishing has been taken away. Because of the strong relationship between female size and fecundity, we also expect them, and that we've got more fishes in marine protected areas, we expect the breeders to within marine protected areas to, of course, produce more offspring, okay, that we'll see, we hope, as in, and as Jeff has pointed out, seed neighbouring waters. However, it's not actually that simple. Replenishment, the survival of individuals through the larval stage coming back to a reef, okay, replenishment is made up of not only the quantity of individuals that are produced, but also the quality of those individuals. We've got about 100 years of information from cold water fishery studies that shows that the quality of reproductive products is actually really important for their survival. We know, we know full well that probably 99 at least percent of the larvae that are produced will die in the larval environment. And that means that really small changes in the larval mortality trajectories early on can have massive effects on the number of individuals that come back to replenish our reefs. Okay, so um, what I would like, actually one of the theses I suppose of today is the idea that maybe some individuals actually can produce better quality offspring because the environment makes them less stressed. And if that's the case, we might have little hot spots of breeding individuals that are producing better quality offspring and they might actually be, cons they might be cons contributing disproportionately to the next generation. Now some of those little hot spots we might have might be marine protected areas if they are going to function properly. So central to this question and central to a lot of the research that I'm doing at the moment is this question here. What determines the quality and survival potential of offspring for fish populations? Okay, now, if we're interested in that sort of question, of course, we've got to look at the mums. Okay, we've got to look at the mums in the system. And for a while, we've been studying this particular species at our model species. It's Pomocentris ambonensis, the ambon damselfish. 
the, the reproductive products we have here, the, the growth and development of these eggs from the moment of conception differs between individual eggs, differs between clutches of eggs, so, and, and much of that variability is parentally driven. It's, there's a genetic basis to that, and there's also a non-genetic, maternally derived mostly basis to it, maternally um, derived contributions of nutrition, of metabolism, of immunology to these developing eggs. Okay. And we'll see that that can actually be quite important in a minute. Now, it's these non-genetic effects that are the link between the female and her environment and the way she's reacting to the environment physiologically and her offspring. Okay? And everything, that, well, the stresses that she receives are going to cause physiological triggers, physiological records in her body and they're going to be passed on to the offspring. Now these stresses might be environmental change, they might be increases in seawater temperature, they might be environmental degradation, <coughs> might be coral bleaching, and they might be just social stress, okay, density dependent social stress that might be triggered by, of course, all of those other types of stresses, environmental change and habitat degradation. Now the stresses that she experiences through her sensory system are going to be changed into physiological um, uh, uh, physiological uh, mechanisms within her body, okay? They have endocrinological responses to all of, of the things that she will receive through her sensory system. And it's a normal vertebrate stress response. When you're stressed, they produce, and we do it as well, we produce high levels of a glutocorticoid, an energy uh, mobilizing agent called cortisol, okay? Cortisol courses through the blood system, and during gametogenesis, during gamete formation in the females, the, the uh, uh, over of uh, the um, oocytes are basically scavenging for lipids. Okay, and cortisol is a lipid, okay, and it just gets sucked into the egg at about the same proportion that sits in the uh, plasma, blood plasma, in. Okay, so we've got females that are, have elevated stress levels, and they're causing of a producing eggs that have higher levels of cortisol than you would expect if they weren't stressed. Research we've done over a number of years has suggested or shown that high levels of cortisol alter developmental rates. Okay, from the first cleavage, ones with high levels of cortisol just twitch faster. Okay, they twitch faster, they divide faster, okay, and then they start doing spasmodic twitches faster than the ones with low levels of cortisol or, low, or ones from less stressed females. Okay. And interestingly enough, this alters, whoop, over here, this alters larval size. This is a, 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 obviously not drawn to scale. This is the larvae, uh, about three millimeters long. It's just hatched. Okay. What we find is highly stressed mums, whatever stress we inflict on them, actually end up through this um, cortisol response, cortisol mechanism, end up producing smaller larvae. Okay. Here's a bit of a data set just to show that. This is uh, the, a plot of um, treatment means. Um, we've, in this particular instance, in this particular experiment, we, we altered the number of females that breeding females could interact with, but the, the manipulation isn't really particularly important. What we've got here is we've got ovarian cortisol, so this is the female cortisol, and here on the y-axis we've got the standard length of the larvae that those females are producing. And we can see there's obviously a negative relationship there where we've got higher levels of stress in females, higher levels of ovarian cortisol. They produce smaller larvae. And it accounts, there's an R squared up there, that accounts for about 89% of the variability in the size of the larvae that these females are producing, suggesting that it could potentially be important. We have a fair amount of information to suggest that larval <coughs> performance is driven by the size of the larvae. We really don't know, we suggest, that it might influence larval survival. We really don't know that. And what I want to show you today is some new information that really does suggest that this sort of mechanism might be really important for larval survival. But firstly, what influences the female's response to those potential stresses? Okay, well, a recent data set we've been playing with um, suggest that female size is more important than the age of the female, okay? And also that there's a density-dependent component thrown in there as well, 
Okay, so if we've got larger females, they seem to be less stressed than smaller females, even if they're the dominant female in a particular social group. Okay, here's a data set here, one of a number we have. We've got female length on the x-axis. We've got ovarian cortisol. That's female cortisol from the same females. Okay, so these little red dots are just individual females on the y cortisol there, the y-axis there. And we can see that there's obviously a negative relationship. The larger the female gets, the uh, less cortisol she's exhibiting within her ovary. Okay, now if we change the density of the females, that these, these, are, these are dominant females within their social groups, if we change the number of interactions they have, we slightly elevate the uh, level of cortisol that they have. Basically we're changing the, um, the intercept, okay, the relationship, the slope of that relationship stays the same. Okay, so larger females seem to have a lower stress response, they have lower cortisol, they produce larger larvae, okay, potentially important. But does this, this stress response that the parents have influence larval survival? To do this and to actually look at it in some sort of basically the realistic, important sort of spatial scale, we've got to have a tag on the larvae that relates in some way to the stress that those larvae have potentially been under. Okay. Luckily for us, for bilaterally symmetrical organisms like vertebrates, the level of asymmetry within the vertebrate, within the organism, is a record of developmental perturbations, potentially stress. Now, for fishes, we found that we can actually, I was going to say rip out, we can remove the otoliths, the ear stones, from, <laughs> from these fishes. Okay, the, this is, is not drawn to scale, okay, unfortunately in some respects. Okay, they're about half the size of the pupil of the eye of these little fishes. They're, they're located just behind the eye. Okay, and we can pull them out and we can look at the difference in shape, okay, mathematically, between the right and the left otolith. And we can use that as an estimate of asymmetry. Okay, interesting. What we want to know, though, if it's going to be a useful tag to us, to answer this particular question, is asymmetry then influenced by maternal stress? Okay, so to actually look at that, what we did is we went into the field, we went into an area, patch, little patch reefs basically, where we knew that the females were in low stressful conditions, they produced eggs with low levels of, of cortisol, we got the eggs that had only just been, um, just been produced, Okay, off the reef here, there's a male guarding the nest site. We remove the eggs from the uh, reef. We put individual eggs into containers, and with those eggs, we inflict on them varying levels of cortisol, which mimic varying levels of maternally derived cortisol. We've done a number of experiments to show that. Okay, so we're basically manipulating or simulating maternal levels of stress okay, within a clutch. Okay, so got round of all sorts of confounding artifacts. Okay. Now, after we've incubated those for about four and a half days, they hatch. Okay. And this is our th little three millimeter larvae. Then we could have a look down here with a microscope. We can look at the developing sagittal otolith on the right and the left side. We can once again look at the shape of those otoliths, the right and the left, and we can get an idea of asymmetry. When we look at that, we can find, lo and behold, that when we alter when we alter the level of cortisol, okay, our seawater control, low levels of cortisol, high levels of supposedly simulated maternally derived cortisol, we see that yes, we can alter, or it does, the, the symmetry of the otolith does actually change in relation to that level of stress that we've inflicted on them. So it might actually be a useful record for us to have as, as a, a measure of stress. Okay, well, whoopee do. it still hasn't answered the question of does maternal stress influence survival? Okay, and to do that and to look at it at a sensible scale, an ecologically important scale for us, particularly as managers, maybe we need to actually have a, a large uh, data set looking at replenishment. Okay, those individuals that survived the larval stage come back to the reef, okay, a data set on replenishment and relate the levels of replenishment, the size of those recruitment pulses to the, the, the degree to which those organisms are asymmetrical. Okay. Here's a data set here from one of my PhD students, Tobe Lemberget. Okay. Um, looking, here we've got here 
Okay, it's for uh, a species of lizard fish collected from a sandblast archipelago. It's an 18 month data set. Each of these points represents a lunar average of replenishment as measured by the number of larvae coming into light traps. Okay, so that they're at the end of their larval stage, they're coming back, flooding into the reefs to settle. Okay, you can see here we've got larval abundance. Okay, on the y-axis logged. Okay, this is our, uh, our measure of reef fish replenishment. And here we've got otolith asymmetry. Don't worry too much about the scale. Okay, it's because it's a multivariate thing. Okay, this is basically um, um, symmetrical over here. It's basically asymmetrical. Bunk. Um, you can see there's a negative relationship. Okay. Interestingly enough, it suggests that otolith asymmetry accounts for 60% of the variability in reef, reef replenishment. Okay. Interesting. Okay, this is a tropical system. The main seasons are, of course, wet and dry. What happens when we divide this data set into wet and dry? Well, ridiculous but true, and I haven't concocted the data set. Otolith asymmetry accounts for 97% of the variability in recruitment strength okay, in, the, in the wet season and 70% in the dry season, suggesting that something about otolith asymmetry is potentially important for these little guys' survival. Okay. Maybe there is that link between maternal environment, maternal stress, and, and the survival of these guys right through to settlement. This isn't the only data set we've got that suggests that. We've got another data set on that same damselfish, okay, that little uh, yellow damselfish, that suggests that and actually suggests the mechanism by which we have differential uh, recruitment. And it suggests that the ones with asymmetrical otoliths actually hear differently than the ones with symmetrical otoliths. Okay, so we even got a bit of a mechanism trying to be worked out there as well. Okay, so let's have a look at, the, at a summary. Marie, uh, maternal stress seems to influence larva quality in some way. We at least know that it seems to influence larval size directly. Now, maternal stress also is recorded in the otoliths of the larvae as asymmetry. And asymmetry somehow, we're really not quite sure how, but somehow seems to affect the survival through to settlement. So that suggests that there might be, big might, there might be a direct link between maternal stress and the replenishment to reefs. Okay. Now if you look at that and, and look at it in relation to our original question, then maybe if marine protectors are, are, pr protected areas are doing their job and they're reducing environmental stresses that are... Uh, uh, are important to these fish populations, then maybe the large uh, females that we find in marine protected areas aren't only going to be producing the large offspring and the, um, the large numbers of offspring, but they're also going to be producing high quality offspring that have a much better chance of survival. So we might actually get even more resilience than we actually expect from a marine protected area if it's managed at an appropriate scale and they actually work. Thanks very much.